Last Lord's Day morning we looked at the doctrine of assurance. At least we began to do it. And this morning I want to, to bring that uh, matter to its conclusion, as it were, to finish off what didn't get said last week. Um, it's not exactly what I would have said last week, it's rather more than I would have said last week, but I've got a whole sermon in which to deal with what remained to be spoken about. Assurance. To be sure that we are the Lord's. To be sure of our salvation. To be sure that the God of heaven is our Father, that Christ is our Saviour, and all that Christ came to do avails for us. It's important, as I said last week, for two reasons, at least two reasons. First of all, to ensure that we're not deceived or deceiving ourselves. And it's also important because without assurance, we cannot know the true joy that we are meant to have as we possess salvation. We're not meant to limp along with uncertainty and doubts and fears and a kind of a misery waiting in suspense to know at the end whether or not we're the Lord's, but rather we're to rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Well, how can we do that unless we have assurance? Well, we've looked at two of three matters that come under this subject heading. We can be sure because, first of all, we are led by God to live a life of humble obedience to him, and that not because we are forced to, but rather because we want to. That's one sign of true conversion. A second thing that we looked at was the testimony of the Holy Spirit within us, who gives us confidence to come before God and call him our Father, and who also works within us uh, in a wonderful way to bring God's word to life. He teaches us through it, we recognise the truth, these kinds of things, and he builds us up in our faith and makes us more like Christ. But there's a third thing that we're going to look at this morning. How can we be sure, from what can we derive absolute rock-solid certainty? Because as we look at ourselves and try to find that humble obedience, well, it depends how we've been doing, doesn't it? If we've had a bad week, as it were, and we've tripped up and we've fallen into sin, then we may lack assurance. We wonder about ourselves. And as we look at ourselves to try to determine the ministry of the Holy Spirit, well, these things can vary and come and go, and, and things are different from, from one day to the next, one week to the next. But what never, ever, ever changes? And it's the promises of God, isn't it, in the Gospel? We change, our experiences change, our spiritual frame may change and does change, but what never, ever, ever changes are the promises of God in Jesus Christ through the Gospel. And really it's the promises of God that are the place of first and last resort. When all else, as it were, falls to one side, we come back to the gospel of Christ, to what God has promised through his beloved Son. Now, to look at this this morning, we're going to turn to a verse that we read earlier on in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men unto the glory of God by us. Now, Paul says that, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but Paul says that at a time when he has planned to, to visit the church in Corinth, but where it seems that the providences of God have foiled his plans and he couldn't get to where he, he, he meant to be. And so he anticipates that there may be believers in, in Corinth, people in Corinth, who are, who are saying of Paul, well, he says one thing and then he does another. He, he says he was going to come and then he didn't come. So what, what's going on with this man? Is he, is he changeable? Can we, can we trust him? And Paul 
develops that thought in his mind and he says, well, if they're thinking that about me, are they also thinking that about the gospel? And he comes very quickly to challenge that thought and he says, well, because of matters outside of my, uh, my, my own personal control, I may have to change my plans. But I will never change what I preach. And why will I never change what I preach? Because the message that I preach never changes. It's always the same. God is always the same. Christ is always the same. The gospel is always the same. So, well, as you may find that I intend to do one thing, but God steps in and I am forced to do something else, you'll never find me preaching another gospel or another Christ. And he says this then in verse 20. All the promises of God in him, that's in Christ, are yea, and in him are men, unto the glory of God by us. And it's got great relevance and application to our theme this morning. The certainty and the unchanging nature of the promises upon which our faith rests, which finally gives us assurance and a definite certainty about the things of God, about our salvation through Christ. It's telling us that we should have complete confidence in every promise that God makes, that we should trust the Lord without hesitation and we should reject all doubts that come flying into our mind as being due to our own weakness and being unworthy of a great and a faithful God. Now we're going to look at this in, in two ways. First of all, why the promises are so certain and then secondly, to remind ourselves of some of those promises. In other words, what is it that God promises to us? I know you'll be saying, well, how long are we going to be here? Because these promises are, 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 are almost innumerable. Well, so they are, but I'm concentrating this morning on gospel promises, saving promises toward, made toward us. Well, why are the promises certain? Well, first of all, because they are the promises of God. They are the promises of God. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him are men. You see, the promises come from the God whose holy character supports and undergirds all that he says. You have a verse in Numbers 23, verse 19 it is, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he met not make it good? You see, this is God. This is the God who has given us this word. And you have to, to link the, the what God says with what God is. And if you begin with a, a, the, the God who is completely truthful, that doesn't change, that, that doesn't say one thing when he means another, well, you come to everything that God has ever said and said, I can believe that. And if I don't believe it, then I'm really casting aspersions upon the nature and the character of God. God is not like us, saying one thing and doing another. You know, we make promises, don't we? And often we, we make promises, we we have every intention of fulfilling them, just like Paul in his travel to Corinth, but something happens and we can't do it. But it's never like that with the Lord. Or well, we make promises one, one to another and um, we may wean well, but it's not within our powers to really do what we ever said we were going to do. And so we're frustrated. But it's not like that with the Lord. To our shame, we sometimes make promises that well, they're said in the heat of the moment and we've got no real intention of ever doing them. But it's not like that with the Lord. He's not like a man, you see. That's what the verse is saying. Numbers 23, verse 19. Paul puts it in a different way. He speaks about the, it, the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We think very much, don't we, about what God can do, but here's one thing that God cannot do. And that's lie. He cannot deceive. 
He cannot bring to us thoughts to, through his words something that is wrong and false. So this is the nature of God. These promises are the promises of God. And because God is of that kind, we, we link his nature, his character, with the word, the promises that he brings to us. Thy word is true from the beginning, says Psalm 119. Jesus said, thy word is truth. And that tells us a whole range of things. That the promises, the word in the scriptures, are not from some malicious enemy who is out to deceive, but they come from a God of all truth. The promises are true, therefore. It also tells us that we should view the promises as being clear and unambiguous. God means what he says, and he says what he means. And it also tells us that the promises, this is important, that the promises are sincere and genuine. God does not dangle out carrots that are ever drawn away from us. He doesn't make promises that he never has any intention of fulfilling. No, everything that he promises is a sincere and a genuine word to us. So the promises are certain. And of course, we think too, again, of the nature of this great God, in that he declares himself to be a God who loves mercy and loves compassion. And therefore, when we find promises in the scriptures that speak of a God of mercy and of compassion, we can believe them, we can accept them, we can rely upon them, because that's what God is like. It's how he loves to represent himself to us. So they're the promises of God. That's the first reason why they're certain. And then the second reason that I would bring to you why, why they are so certain is that his promises are made certain and secure in Jesus Christ. You see the verse here. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him are men. So he links the promises to his own Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Yea and Amen. And the word yea there simply means that the promises of God in him, in Christ, are definite and sure and certain. And then he says, and in him are men. Now that's a word that we always use when we close a prayer, isn't it? And you know what it means, don't you? It means, more or less, so be it. Now when we say that to God, it is a request. May it be, all that I've just prayed, may it be, so be it. It's a request made unto God. But when God is said to pronounce Amen, it's not a request, it's a pronouncement. It's a decree that comes from heaven. When God says, may it be, it is not a request that, that is made to some outside exterior power. It is a decree that comes from the sovereign throne of God in heaven who says, what I have said, it shall be. It shall stand. It shall happen. So, you bring this to the promises of God, and in him they are yea, and in him Amen. So what God has promised, it shall be. It will definitely come to pass. This is the intent of Paul and his wish that we should understand the, these things. In him, the promises are secured and guaranteed in Christ who cannot fail. Now, Let me put this simply. I, I was tempted to, to take you to, a, to another passage of the scripture, but I don't want to overburden you with texts and, uh, and, and too much. But, but, but you realize that, that um, and you can look up these verses in John 6 and, and in John 17. There's your homework for the week. Read John 6, read John 17. And what you'll find there are words that Im indicate that God's people, believers, are given to Christ, those which thou hast given me. That's what Jesus prays 
in John 17. Not just his disciples there and then, but all down through the ages. There is a people that the Father has given to Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, there are two things you can think of. The first is that the Father has given his people to Christ with the wish and the will and the intent that that people should be saved, that their sins should be forgiven, that they should be kept through life, and that they should finally enter heaven at the last. That is God's intent or will for his people. Now, how is that will going to be accomplished? Does he say to his people, well, that's what I would like for t t to happen for you. Now you're going to have to go away and try and do your best to work it out. Oh no, that would never happen. That would never do. So what does he do? He looks to his own son and he says more or less to his own son, it is my will that this people should know the forgiveness of their sins and should know all the joy and all the blessings of heaven forevermore. And you, my son, will accomplish everything that is necessary for that to happen. So he gives his people to his son and gives his son the responsibility of dying for their sins, of rising again for their justification, of sending forth the Holy Spirit to apply that salvation to their hearts, to caring for them and watching over, th over them all through the days of their life in this world until they're in heaven, at which time God's will has been altogether fulfilled and accomplished. All the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen. Christ, you see. That's how we can be sure of our salvation. We trust our souls to the Saviour. How do we know that it will, it will avail for us? Because it's Christ's responsibility. God has given them the, the responsibility for our souls. If, if God had said, as I said a minute ago, if the Lord had said even to, to one small degree, well, it partly rests on you. Well, we could never have assurance, could we? But if it all rests on Christ, we can. In all our sins and failings and doubts and fears, what do we do? We look away to the one who bears our souls. It's his responsibility to get us into heaven. Now, I think this is the most wonderful way of looking at things. And it undergirds us and it strengthens us. My soul is in the hands of Jesus Christ. The will of God is that I should be in heaven. And the will of God will be accomplished by the Son of God who never can fail who in every respect will bring me unto glory at the end. Given to Christ, let me just mention this as well, as his bride, as his bride. And there's that verse in Revelation 19. The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Do you know who the bride of Christ is? The bride of Christ is the church. Christ is your husband. And you will be gathered to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You've been given to him. Given to him. The Father has loved you. The Son loves you. The whole Godhead is committed to bringing you to that great marriage supper of the Lamb. This is how we're to think of the matter of our salvation. If our faith is in Jesus Christ, in that most simple way that the Gospel would have it to be, then we, we ought to derive assurance and certainty from the whole way in which the Bible tells us about the scheme of salvation. The will of God accomplished by Jesus Christ and this beautiful picture of the intent of God that his son should have a bride arrayed in the fine linen of his own perfect righteousness. 
So this is, this is how we're to think. This is what we're to believe. This is where we're to derive the comfort of the promises of God. Let me say this before we move on to the promises themselves. And this has key to the matter of assurance. That if it was God's eternal will that his people should be in heaven with their sins forgiven, and if God could safely and confidently entrust that will to be accomplished by his Son. In other words, if God could love us as he has done and will to have us in heaven and say with confidence to his Son, I give this as a charge and a responsibility to you because I know you will not fail. If God could have that confidence in his own Son, why in the world can't we? If God could entrust your soul to his son, why in the world can't you? You see the point? What a terrible thing doubt is. What a, a sinful thing almost doubt is. There is the Godhead saying, these people are mine. These people are going to be washed from their sins and they're going to be with me in heaven. Christ is going to make that sure. And here we are. Oh, I'm not sure whether it can work. I'm not sure whether Christ is enough for me. I'm not sure whether my sins are going to keep me out. I'm not sure about one thing and another. What business have we with all these doubts? What business have we going around as though the gospel doesn't mean anything, that the work of Christ is incomplete or the promises are insincere? This is not what you read in the scriptures. All these things come from within or they're planted within us by the enemy. Believe in Christ and all these things are true. The promises of God in him are yea and in him are men unto the glory of God by us. But what are the promises? Well, where do you begin? Where do you end? But let me divide this into two just for simplicity's sake. There are first of all what we might call positive promises, what God will do. What God has promised to do in the matter of our salvation. Let me just bring um, uh, some well-known verses to you. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Isaiah 45, verse 22, that is. What's the obvious meaning? Look unto me. It means trust and rely upon me, and be ye saved. What's the obvious implication in that? When we look unto God, when we trust the Lord and rely upon him, salvation will come. It's so obvious, isn't it? It's crystal clear what God means by that. And then you come into the New Testament, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you'd never heard that verse before, and you heard it for the first time this morning, what impression would it make upon you? But that the purpose of Christ coming into the world was that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish because of their sins, but have everlasting life because of his grace and his sacrifice. That's what you'd think it meant. And friends, that's exactly what it does mean. So simple, so profound, but so simple. Faith in Christ, it brings you release from death and the possession of life. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But what does that first phrase mean? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It means that faith makes you an instant possessor of everlasting life. Hath everlasting life. Not may have, not possibly will have, not going to let you know and I'm going to keep you hanging and in suspense until that great day. No, you have it already. Faith 
brings instantly forgiveness of sin, justification, acceptance with God, and being the possessor of everlasting life. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ couldn't possibly have made it any plainer than that. And these are the promises, you see, the promises of the gospel. Think of Paul in uh, Philippi with the jailer. The jailer was terrified. He just about, was just about to commit suicide. And he says to the apostle, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle sums it all up in those memorable words. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's so clear, isn't it? And so definite. Thou shalt be saved. Not, not, well, you know, you're a very bad man and you've got a terrible record and you've never given one thought to God, but, well, there's, there's maybe some sort of hope for somebody like you. It's not like that. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's definitive. It's absolute certainty, the message that the apostle is bringing to this man. Well, it goes on and on and on, all these wonderful promises. You think of what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples in that last discourse that began in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also, and so on. He promised heaven. He promised heaven and he showed that he was the way to heaven. And did the Lord Jesus intend by what he said to his disciples in those early verses of John 14, was his intention to give them anything else than absolute clarity, not only about where he was going, but how that they could go to be with him where he was. He says what he means, and he means what he says. And all the promises of God in him are yea and in him are men unto the glory of God by us. So these are just almost a random sample of positive promises of what God says he will do for the believer. But then there are negative promises. In other words, what God promises he will not do. He says in Hebrews 8, quoting from Jeremiah, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. What a thing. What a thing. It doesn't mean that God forgets. God doesn't forget anything. God can't forget anything. But what it means is that our sins, as many as they are, he will never bring them back to his mind. He will never bring them up again. He will never accuse us again. He will never hold those things against us. Because why? They're forgiven. Christ has died at Calvary's cross that we might know forgiveness. I will never accuse you. I will never bring you into my courtroom, as, in, as it were, and say, do you remember when you did this? Do you remember how you spoke then? Do you remember... Your attitude on that certain particular day, I will remember them no more. You have a promise in Romans 8, 38. I am persuaded, says Paul, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think of that. He will never remember your sins, and you will never be separated from him. In all his goodness, in all his mercy, in all his grace, whatever experience we go through in life, and even when we go through that experience of death itself, and then when we enter into eternity, we never, ever can be separated from this great God. As believers, all we shall ever know is the love of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God. 
It shall never be withdrawn from us. Even when God chastens us, as sometimes he has to do, we're never separated from his love because it's love that chastens us. Think of it, friends. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. Never, ever to be separated. You know, Christ was separated from his Father, wasn't he? On that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But God will never forsake you. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. He says specifically in Hebrews 13, quoting again from the Old Testament, he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You're going through some trial or trouble at the moment. Many of us here are, are here in, in different sorts of ways. It's a wonderful promise at a time like that, isn't it? That whatever we face, God never forsakes us. He never leaves us. He never fails us. And we, we associate a promise like that with a time of trial. But, oh, I would suggest that this goes far, far deeper than that. It is a pledge, an eternal pledge, whereby God binds himself to us. He binds himself to us. He is our God and we are his people. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You may sin and forget me, but I will never leave you or forsake you. You may backslide, but I will bring you back. You may go through very dark experiences, but I will be with you in them, I will bring you through them, and I will be with you forever after, following these things. This is what this means. Forever and forever, our God and our Saviour. Forever and ever, the lover of our souls. Forever and ever, the one who will pour out his grace and his mercy and his blessings into our innermost beings, whereby there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. All the promises of God, you see, all of them. The Puritans used to speak about racking the word of God for the promises. Go digging into the word of God. Mine the word of God for the promises. And then think of Christ and say to yourself, all of these promises are mine. I am unworthy. My faith is so weak at times. My walk is so unstable. My frame is so fickle. And yet the promises of God are mine. And God himself is mine. And that all of his doing, and not of my own self. This is where we find assurance. Leaning upon God. Believing his word. Trusting him for the God that he is and the promises that he makes to us. So, dear friends, what is the present state of someone who believes in Jesus Christ? Well, let me put it like this. You're loved in Christ. Your sins are forgiven in Christ. You have been justified in Christ. You have been adopted unto God through Christ. You are cared for every moment upon earth by the triune God. You are bound for heaven at the end and you will never be lost or separated from the love of God as it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your faith is in Christ. That's the truth concerning you. So we do look and we must look for those inward signs of true Christianity. That humble obedience to the word of God. I'm not thinking about it as being an imposition upon us but as being our chief joy and delight because this is God's way. It's a delightful way. It's a way in which I want to live and praise God for ever opening my eyes to that better way, so far better than the world's way. And we see ourselves humbled and obedient before the Lord. 
And we have that sense within us, given of the Holy Spirit, whereby we can come to God and call him Abba, Father. We don't approach him as someone that we dread and would rather avoid, but we come like a child running to his beloved Father, who picks him up and envelops him and embraces him and who makes that child to feel and to know his love and his goodness toward him. We have that sense of being able to do that. And we see the work of the Holy Spirit making these promises come to life, making the word of God mean something, giving us a hunger and a thirst for the means of grace, the worship of God in the public services, in our private homes, reading the scriptures, coming to the Lord in prayer, the Holy Spirit's work. We look for these things and they're a sure sign that we're the Lord's. But really this is the bedrock of it all. This is where it begins and this is where it finally ends. The certainty of the promises of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the promises of God. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. It shall be. And as the verse goes on to say, it is all to the glory of God. Or may the Lord give us that assurance that we may not just limp through life, but leap with joy in our hearts because of Christ and his redeeming grace and his indefinable love. Amen.